celestial greetings. I'm Janet Booth, a professional astrologer from West Hartford, Connecticut, and welcome to my program on astrology called Looking Up. This episode I am entitling Give Peace a Chance. And you probably remember the Beatles song, all we are saying is give peace a chance. And I'll explain to you when we get into the show why I have titled this episode with that name. But first, I'd like to backtrack for a moment. We had the summer show, July and August, that talked about the great American eclipse on August 21st, the new moon or solar eclipse. And at the time I talked about that, I was looking mostly at... Mm, sort of cultural trends or things in politics and I really wasn't thinking about some of the other things that some astrologers look at which regard weather and natural phenomena such as volcanoes or earthquakes. And as I tape this on the 21st of September we have just had let's see, in the past month, in the past three weeks, three earthquakes in Mexico and three big hurricanes and maybe three and a half, four, I don't know. There's a lot of hurricanes. So I thought we ought to take just a brief look because it's very interesting. It's a complex subject. I'm just going to show you one facet of it. And there's a map that they're going to bring up on the screen for you to look at with me. But it's the United States and Mexico, might show a little of Canada. And you'll see a eclipse path going across, you know, from Oregon to South Carolina. That's the path that you're all familiar seeing. But the other lines are very interesting. And they're part of a study in astrology called astrocartography, or actually the generic is astrolocality, and a certain practitioner has. Um, copyrighted the name astrocartography. But this is a look at any moment in time, somewhere in the world the sun is rising, somewhere in the world the sun is setting, somewhere in the world the sun is at the overhead position at the top of a chart where it would be basically at local noon time, or it could be at the very foot of the chart, which would be similar to local midnight time. Well, you can use that technique with any of the planets of those four positions which would really constitute the four directions of a chart. And I took the moment of the eclipse, pretty much the height of the eclipse, and I just looked at the, well I looked at all the lines, but I printed off to show you today just the sun-moon combination line because as the moon blocked the sun they are in the same zodiac degree and so they come on the same place on the map. And it was in the middle of the day here in America. So, of course, it was noon somewhere. And with daylight savings time, you know, that can be a little bit off from what celestial time might be. But if you, as you look at the map, that center line going down through Nebraska and Texas and into Mexico is the sun-moon line. And it's a perfectly vertical line because it has to do with the sort of vertical center of the chart. What was most interesting to me and what I've marked on here, and I hope you'll be able to see it when it projects onto your TV screen, are the locations of landfall for both the Hurricane Harvey and the Hurricane Katia. Now, Harvey was pretty interesting because at the day of the eclipse, well, let's say this, there are asteroids that are named all kinds of different proper names. This is like a band of 10,000 or more big rocks out in the area between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, closer to Mars's orbit. Mars goes around in two years, Jupiter in 12, and most of these asteroids go around in four to five year orbits. And they have mythological names for maybe the first hundred that were discovered or something, and then all kinds of names. I mean, there might be one with your name on it. I found out when I turned 50, somebody had just discovered an asteroid and named it Booth. So it can be fun to look at these, and sometimes they have uncanny synchronicities with what's going on astrologically. So the asteroid Harvey at 
the eclipse happened to be at the last degree of cancer, 29 cancer, and it was making a 90 degree friction connection with Uranus, well, roughly 90. And Uranus can mean wild, unusual, record-breaking, um, usually it contributes to a lower barometric pressure, so that might, I think that's true, let's see, no, it raises the barometric pressure. Well, anyway, a low pressure system is what's necessary for a, a hurricane to form, but I thought that was pretty interesting. And then, also at that same eclipse, now, the hurricane didn't happen right then. What happens is sort of the energizing of the whole month that follows the eclipse happens from that eclipse moment. So Irma happened to be at 14 to 15 degrees of Virgo, lining up almost across from Neptune. Well, Neptune is definitely about ocean. You know, it's named for the god of the seas. And wind, not wind so much, water, you know, things like that. It would be strong in hurricanes. And then there was Maria. Maria was at 22 degrees of Sagittarius, and it was at the same degree as Saturn, which later, when Maria came along and started forming, um, or started hitting, was closer to the um, third quarter moon at the 13th of September, between there and the new moon on the 20th of September. And during that time, it formed what's called a T-square, or a square anyway, with another planet in Pisces, almost a planet, Chiron, which can mean injury. And at the, the 20th, that new moon, it was making this thing called the T-square, the sun and moon with Chiron across from each other and Maria in between. So a lot of injury and damage around that new moon from Maria. But on this map, which we'll bring up again now, it's got the location of landfall for Harvey. Look how close that is in Texas to where this sun-moon line leaves the landmass and goes into the Gulf of Mexico. And then when it comes back near the landmass of Mexico, very close to where Katia made landfall, all during that moon cycle that followed from this new moon eclipse. And the three earthquakes that we've had as of this taping on the 21st of September have all been very close to that sun-moon line as well. So I thought that that was fascinating to look at. And why I say three eclipses, uh, earthquakes so far, I'm very concerned that there's going to be some more. And we will find out probably by the time you are watching this, we may know if there were any more in the latter part of September. And you can go back and look at my September show, Shaky September, when I talk about some of that stuff. And one of the shakiest parts of September is from the 23rd to the end of the month. And um, we haven't gotten there yet as of this taping. And that's when I'm kind of um, concerned. In fact, a numerologist friend of mine called me last night and she said, what do you know astrologically about the 23rd of September? And I told her. And then she, I said, why? She says, oh, well, somebody she knows out in San Francisco is, you know, um, kind of a forecasty person and, and predicting the end of the world on that day. I said, well, I don't think so unless it's like, you know, somebody stupid pushes the button and we start a nuclear annihilation. So we'll hope not for that. Now, the other thing that's interesting about looking at an eclipse chart, besides looking at that map, and I don't know if there'll be anything special that happens where those two lines cross, where the eclipse path crosses with the sort of noon line, but we'll keep our eye on that. It's sort of in southern Nebraska. But what's also good is you look at the degree the eclipse occurred at, which was 28, almost 29 of Leo, and then you see if any other planets come along after that, through that degree, and it's like that degree has been sensitized at the eclipse and then gets activated, or we oftentimes use the word triggered, in astrology. So, hmm, here's the eclipse. Think of this. Remember, it's 28, almost 29 Leo. And we give it a few uh, little degrees, what we call orb or, you know, flexibility. Okay, when Harvey made landfall, nothing at that degree. But the halfway point of Mercury and Mars, which were traveling close together, were, um, was at 28 and a half 
no, almost 29, just about exactly, 5 sixtieths of a degree from that eclipse degree. So I thought that's pretty interesting because Mercury is wind and Mars is speed, so you have high wind. Okay, at the full moon on the 6th of September, where Irma made her landfall in Barbuda that day, the first Mexico earthquake off the coast of Oaxaca, which was an 8.2, but it didn't destroy or kill as much as the one closer to Mexico City that was bigger later on in the month. But that had Mercury at 28 of Leo. Then um, Hurricane Jose also became a Category 1 hurricane on that full moon on the 6th with the same Mercury at that degree. Then when we come up to Katia making landfall, Mercury was at 29, so that's still pretty close. And when Venus came through 28 to 29 on the 18th and 19th of September, that's when we had these two earthquakes in uh, Mexico. One of them was only a 5.6, but it was like less than a day before the other one that was 7.1. And Venus was the last of the regular planets to come through that degree of the eclipse in Leo. So hopefully some of the intensity is going to die down from that. And there's so much more I could say about that, but time is limited here, and I want to talk a little bit about October. So, um, enough said about that. Let's see. Da -da. A1, A2, yes, okay, we covered that. Here we come to our Give Peace a Chance. So, you probably know that Libra is the sign of peace. It's also harmony, justice, fairness. Sometimes even people, you'll hear the phrase, no peace without justice. I agree. And you may or may not know that John Lennon was a Libra. And his birthday is October 9th. He would have been 74 this year. And the 9th of October happens to be the last day that big Jupiter is going through the sign of Libra. And Jupiter takes about 12 years to go around the whole zodiac, so it spends about one year in each sign, and it has been there since, I think, last September or October. And then it's moving on into Scorpio. So before it actually leaves, we have a beautiful full moon on the 5th of October that has a very kind of rare condition. So any full moon is when the moon is opposite the sun, it's going to be in the opposite sign of the sun. So when the sun is in Libra, the moon is in Aries. Aries, ruled by Mars, god of war. It has that feeling of assertiveness, aggression, confrontation, arguments, things like that. But when it's together with Venus, Venus sweetens out that Mars. Maybe it might say, oh, I'm going to fight for justice and peace. But at this new moon, we happen to have an exact, what we call conjunction, at the same degree, and this would be at 19 degrees of Virgo, for Mars and Venus. So I thought, well, how often does it happen that we have a conjunction of the rulers of the signs that the sun and moon are in at a full moon? and particularly this combination, Venus with Mars. So I looked and I said, well, Mars and Venus get together 16 times in the 20-year span between 2000 and 2020, but only one of those times is at a full moon. The next time they have a conjunction at the full moon will be in February of 2022, and they will not rule the signs that the sun and moon are in. So I said, how special is this? I looked over 250 years, and I only found two similar circumstances. One was in 1863, which was during the Civil War. Didn't sound too peaceful there, huh? And one will be in 2098, and I don't think I'll be here to see that one. There were also two instances of the full moon, the moon in Libra, and then the sun in Aries. And that captures the same power of these ruling planets, just in a little opposite order. And those don't come up till 2054. If I live to be 102, I can see that one, or 101. And on uh, 2000, 
109, 2109. So you can see this doesn't happen very often. So when I see, oh, we've got Jupiter still in Libra, we've got the Libra ruler trying to tamp down any Mars business from that full moon in Aries, this is our time to try to give peace a chance. And as I tape this on the 21st of September, we are in UN week, and our president has gone into the UN and made some pretty um, strong statements, let's call them that. And they didn't sound tremendously peacefully oriented, but I am always the hopeful one. And like I say, we have some tough things coming up at the end of September, but once we get through those, I honestly do think that October is going to be a little bit better of a month. So, let's see what is happening here. Ah, I was mentioning before how we had a hurricane with the thing called T-square, this 920 new moon, sun and moon opposite this Chiron with Maria in the middle. So, this is a wider, not as precise instance, but we do have Venus and Mars will move through the degrees that kind of make a T-square with Saturn and Chiron. Well, Chiron can have to do with injury, but also the repair of injury. Saturn oftentimes means getting things straightened out or laying down the rules or um, squaring things away, getting organized, maybe repressing sometimes. So it might be that it's a time when we could hammer out some compromises that would help things improve some of the difficult situations that have been going on. And yes, I am the hopeful one. Okay, so let's see what else happens here. Oh yes, so other things that are going to help us be giving peace a chance. Venus is going to come into Libra, which she's the ruler of, on the 14th of October. And she stays there until 6th of November. Part of that time, starting on the 22nd of October, Mars, remember they were together here at this um, full moon on October 5, it's not following too far behind Venus, it goes into Libra on October 22nd. So there are eight, 16, eight, six, about two weeks that the two of them will both be in the sign of Libra. And that kind of also helps us give peace a chance, if we can. Um, now, I should also say that Libra is the sign concerned with relationships, one-on-one, -on -one, marital relationships, partnerships, business partnerships, teamwork, cooperation, contracts, meeting of the minds and people even who are our clients. So when we see so much Libra activity coming up, this is the time of year for you to be involved with um, clients, relationships, all the things I just mentioned, and they'll kind of have an extra oomph or boost going with this. And that may continue even into November because we have the new moon in October on the 19th sets up four weeks and it starts in Libra. Now that gets a little bit tricky because it is a difficult combination with the sun and moon together, which they always are at a new moon, and they're exactly across from Uranus. And Uranus is the shake things up and literally sometimes it's about shocking things like electricity is shocking. It can have to do with explosions it's very slow and it's currently traveling 45 degrees, which is a friction position, with Neptune. And Neptune has to do with, like we mentioned before, the hurricanes and uh, water and everything about the oceans. But it's also in charge of the whole oil, gas, and chemical industry. It relates to the pharmaceutical industry and the medical field and even things like self-medicating, alcohol, um, street drugs, all of that kind of stuff. So we may find that there's more problems in those areas in the four weeks that follow the October 19th new moon. But that is such a slow-moving pattern, that 45, that it's also quite 
hairy when Jupiter's been interacting with them. That's very strong at the full moon. So if the full moon doesn't, you know, bring us some kind of big difficulty, well, we can say this. Jupiter is a magnifier, but it's also a planet that relates to connecting far and wide. It rules everything in the media and on the internet, and it's also related to foreign relations, long-distance travel, things like that. So we may find some Uranus shocking and Neptune confusing factors coming up related to those areas. Now this slow-moving 45 between Uranus and Neptune, it happens five times, and I did mention this in the summer show because the first time was August 11th, and the second time is October 7th, very close to that full moon. And then it goes on three more times that stretch into May of 2019. So this is a long thing. And there'll be certain times when there's bursts and it's more intense. So let's see. We've got the October 10th, I mentioned, that Jupiter shifts into Scorpio. Well, Scorpio, we're going to talk about a lot more in the next episode of Looking Up. But it is a sign that has to do with what we call shared resources things that we all use or pool our resources for, and as well as joint financial matters. So it does relate to things like the markets, insurance, taxes, credit, all that kind of thing. Hmm. I don't think Jupiter was quite close enough to this Uranus-Neptune for that Equifax mess, but we're certainly a lot of people are finding themselves shocked and confused about what's going on with that. Okay. Um, hmm. I'm going to come back to the idea here of, oh right, I talked about Jupiter goes into Scorpio, and the Sun goes into Scorpio not long after that. The Sun goes in on the 23rd of October, and by the 26th of October, Sun and Jupiter connect. So there'll be one day each year, it's different every year, when the Sun gets together with Jupiter. And those are two of the usually considered best planets and oftentimes has um, very good possibilities. Things open up for us. We oftentimes feel sunny and optimistic. And it is a good time usually for launching something in the internet variety. Uh, I noticed that in my Janet's Planets calendar, where I rate the days every single day, one through five. Fives are the best, very rare. Ones are the worst. Threes are even okay in the middle. Four is pretty darn good. So right around then, when we get to the 24th to the 27th of October, you might want to make a note of this. That's a really good time because the days go three, three, four, three. And that four is on the 26th when the Sun and Jupiter get together. And it's early in the moon cycle because the moon, new moon was the 19th. So it's in that waxing or growing part where we say that's when you want to get something started that's going to have growth potential. So take a look at that. The other thing I want to talk to you about is Juno. Juno is one of those thousands of asteroids in that space between Mars and Jupiter. And it was one of the first four discovered there, one of the larger ones. And it's named for the Roman goddess who was the wife of Jupiter. Jupiter was like the head god, and she was like the head goddess. Um, so it has a lot to do with marital matters. In fact, when I was um, participating with a group of astrologers doing research right here, based in West Hartford, although some of them are from different parts around the world because they work together on the internet, uh, they're called the Astro Investigators, or the Gators for short, and Alfie Lavoie, who many of you may know, who's been an astrologer in West Hartford for decades. He's in, um, the head of that group and started it. We did a study with husbands and wives, charts with their birth times and everything, studied millions of factors, well, almost thousands of factors. And we did prove statistically significantly that Juno does have a lot to do with marital matters. Well, Juno's traveling through Capricorn now, as is Pluto. And Pluto is a planet about change and transformation. It's also a planet about endings and, well, can be, be re-beginning. Uh, sometimes it's about destruction. Sometimes it's turn the page, clear the deck, start a whole new chapter. 
So when I see Juno come creeping up on Pluto, when it's going to join Pluto and then pass it and leave Pluto in the dust, then I'm saying this is an important time about marriage and if marriage is going to transform or end. And some couples might have some very traumatic experiences during this period. So we sometimes think about a 10 degree um, window on either side of the exact coming together has some significance. I like to use a little closer than that, but let's just say the 10 degree approach begins October 4th, which is the day before that full moon on October 5th. And at that time, the sun and moon are opposite, and they're making that kind of a T with Pluto and Ju Juno. And Mercury's very close to the sun. It's a communication planet, so if you're having marital difficulties, you really need to talk things through. Their exact coming together is on November 11th, and then they trail off to the, um, for a month till December 11th, till they're more than 10 degrees apart. Juno's the faster one, so it sneaks up on Pluto, joins Pluto, leaves Pluto in the dust. So again, it's kind of an important time if you are having some difficulties, try to work them out. Now right there around the 10th and the 11th of October, we have a very good uh, magical, what I call quintile triangle. Sun, Neptune, it shines light on the things that are in the shadow or confusing with series, a lot of caring, support. And there's one other quintile triangle. Um, let's see, the 16th to the 22nd of October. You think I can find that one? Yes, Jupiter with Chiron, a big healing with the node, which is saying what direction do we need to go in kind of collectively and bond together. So we'll be looking for some healing in that regard. And just as we go through all of this Libra energy, try to love one another and think in terms of what John Lennon brought to us um, so much. I mean, think of imagine, imagine a world that, you know, everybody lives in peace. So just like Yoko and John said, I'm going to close this out with one of my favorites. All we are saying is give peace a chance, and we'll see you next month on Looking Up.